Were Cinderella's slippers made of glass or fur? Folklore enthusiasts have been arguing over the answer for more than a century, and in this episode, we're getting to the bottom of this controversial theory. If you're confused and need some context, you may have heard of a little movie called Cinderella. It was produced by this tiny company, Walt Disney Productions, back in 1950, and as time has gone on, it's developed quite a cult following. The film was praised for its heartwarming story, impressive animation, and beautiful art design which spawned two icons that would forever symbolize the fairy tale genre, the pumpkin carriage and the glass slippers. But these were not inventions of Disney. They come from the fairy tale Disney based the movie on, Charles Perrault's Cinderella, or The Little Glass Slipper. Originally published in France all the way back in 1697, Perrault's fairy tale isn't the oldest of Cinderella stories, but thanks to the Disney adaptation, it is the most well known among English speakers. And to this day, there is is much debate over whether we've been told the correct version. There are some folklorists who believe the iconic but highly impractical glass slipper was born out of a mistranslation and that our heroine was intended to be rocking fur on her feet. I am not one of those folklorists, but it's an intriguing theory that shows why it's important to have unbiased, accurate translations and that's why I think it's worth exploring. In the spirit of that, this episode is also sponsored by the number one language learning app in the world, Babbel. As you can tell from today's subject of discussion, it's easy for details to get lost in translation. So when you're learning a new language, you wanna be positive that you're using the best possible resource. That's where Babbel comes in. There's a few different language learning apps out there, but none are quite like Babbel, which not only teaches you real life conversation, but also explains the cultural context of languages. For example, if you're learning Spanish, you can access advanced courses on the different foods in Spain and Latin America. As you all know, I restarted my language journey a few months ago, partially because my wife and I have some vacation plans, but also because of how many different languages I come across in my research. It'd be nice to understand at least one of them, you know? So I got back to doing Spanish lessons with the app last month, and it's going pretty well. Check this out. Donde esta el baño? En serio, es una emergencia. See? Even my accent's getting better. No como mis entrañas. With summer right around the corner, I'm sure that some of you watching have vacation plans approaching too, but it's not too late to prep because Babbel has been scientifically proven to help you start speaking a new language in just three weeks. And if you don't believe me, you can give it a shot yourself because they offer a 20 day money back guarantee so there's no risk. So if you wanna start speaking a new language and get 60% off your subscription, hit my link in the description or pinned comment. Now, I'm sure there's a few of you who are already a bit skeptical of this theory because glass and fur have so little in common, they might as well be opposites. So how could anyone get them confused, right? The answer lies in linguistics. You see, Charles Perrault was a French author, and so naturally his Cinderella story had a French title, Cendrio ou la petite pantoufle de verre. I'm pronouncing most of that wrong, but I got the important word right, verre. Ver means glass when it's spelled how it is in this title, V-E-R-R-E. -E. But when ver is spelled V-A-I-R, it refers to a specific kind of squirrel fur that only the upper class could afford to wear in the medieval era. And because there's a few different theories about when and how these homophones were mixed up, I crowdsourced some explanations from the comment section of my Messed Up Origins of Cinderella Revisited episode to get an idea of what people think happened. Some believe that Perot originally used the word ver, meaning fur, but because that word was used more in the Middle Ages and had fallen out of the public lexicon before his time, the translator simply assumed Perot spelled it wrong and changed the word to glass when translating it to English. It wouldn't be the first bold assumption made by a translator, but personally, I don't buy this one because no one has ever been able to produce any evidence to support it. Granted, it is a 300-year-old story, so it's possible that all of the first edition French prints have been lost or destroyed by now, but if you look at the version Scottish author Andrew Lang included in his Blue Fairy book from 1889, he clearly calls it glass. The reason that's important is because the source he used for his translation was written alongside the original French print from 1697. And the preface of this print clearly states the intention was to accurately recreate the original spelling, punctuation, use of capital letters, and so forth. In other words, they didn't make any changes to Perrault's original work, and they still called it glass. But once again, there is an asterisk to explain. 
Isn't folklore fun? The asterisk is that the original 1697 publication was not the first time his stories were published in French because of course they weren't. Most, if not all of them, had previously appeared in a French magazine with a French title I cannot pronounce. And the authors of that hyper-accurate recreation didn't have access to any preserved copies of that magazine. At least not any issues containing the more notable stories from his collection. So it is possible that the very first time the Cinderella story was printed, Perot used the form of air meaning fur and was misquoted every single time after that. But I'm going to make a bold assumption here and say that he more than likely proofread the collection he published in 1697 to make sure the stories came out as he intended. Now, another popular theory I find a little more believable solely because there's fewer steps involved is that it was Perot himself who got confused, not a bunch of translators. Since he had been told the story orally, he supposedly couldn't distinguish between what ver was being used and incorrectly concluded the storyteller meant glass slipper. It is plausible, but once again, not perfect, because in order for this theory to be proven, someone would have to dig up an older variant of the Cinderella story where her shoes are made of fur and the written record shows that doesn't exist. But we'll talk more about that later. Because at this point, you might be wondering, if there's really no evidence to support these theories, where did they come from, and why do people believe in them? And I don't blame you. Those are fair questions. As far as we can tell, all this confusion about how Ver was translated originated with one guy, a French author, Honor de Balzac. I mean, Honore de Balzac misread the teleprompter there. In his book, La Comédie Humaine, Sir Catherine de' Medici, published in 1846, he discusses the history of the fur trade, women's fashion, and the use of ver, which he describes as imperial sable that might only be worn by kings, dukes, and men of high rank holding certain offices. Then he mentions how the word ver has fallen so far out of use over the last century that Cinderella's famous slipper, probably made of fur, has become a glass slipper. Weirdly enough, Enough, he also claims that a nameless yet distinguished French poet was obliged to restore and explain the correct spelling of the word to publishers. I'm gonna call BS on that though because at risk of repeating myself, no one has ever found a printed copy that uses the first spelling of ver. So if that really did happen, the poet wasted his time because the publishers clearly did not listen to his correction. Now, while I personally may not agree with this theory, I don't want the people who do to think I'm mocking them in any way when I make jokes about it. I totally understand the appeal. I mean, glass slippers would be impossible for her to wear. If they didn't shatter while she was dancing or running, they would have both slipped right off her sweaty feet and I guarantee the noise they made while clinking on the ground was obnoxious. Changing the slippers from glass to fur eliminates all of these concerns and is way more realistic, because that's what we want in our fairy tales, right? Realism? I mean, there is still some magic in the story. Her fairy godmother, the pumpkin carriage, the mice turning to horses, the birds helping her with chores, but at least those pesky, unrealistic glass slippers are dealt with. Otherwise, this story wouldn't be plausible. In all seriousness, fairy tales are like cats. They do not abide by the laws of nature. Somewhat ironically, they're often about the laws of nature, but they don't follow them. You don't even have to look at other kinds of fairy tales to know that. Let's specifically look at the Cinderella stories from other countries. In the first episode of my featured folklore series, I share the Greek variant called Little Saddle Slut. Her shoes aren't described in this version, but her dress is made of heavenly light. In the Chinese variant, the heroine's fairy godmother is a koi fish that gives her golden shoes from beyond the grave. But if two examples weren't enough, check this out. In 1893, Marion Rolf Cox published published a book where she analyzed 345 versions of Cinderella, as well as two tale types that are nearly identical to Cinderella. Out of those 345 stories, six included glass slippers, which doesn't sound like a lot, but wanna know how many had fur slippers? Fucking zero. Slippers have been described as made of silver, silk, covered in jewels and pearls, and embroidered with gold. A Venetian story featured diamond shoes, and an Irish variant had blue-tinted glass shoes, but not a one mentioned slippers made from expensive squirrel fur. In fact, the only stories where the Cinderella character wears fur are stories like the Grimm Brothers' All Kinds of Fur, where the animal pelt is used as a hideous disguise. But the real kicker is that Perot himself wrote a variant of that tale called Donkey Skin, 
where a princess dons the pelt of a donkey and everyone mistakes her for a deformed half animal. It's not until she takes off the fur and puts on her dress that's as bright as the sun, which I would argue is at least as implausible as glass slippers, that someone of status appreciates her beauty, solidifying that Perot's perspective on fur clothing was that it was not a symbol of wealth and status, but rather wildness and ugliness. Not to mention that while changing the slippers from glass to fur does eliminate the practical problems our heroine would face when walking and dancing, it also makes it impossible for the prince to identify his mystery woman which I would argue is more important to the plot. The entire purpose for the glass slippers is that only Cinderella can wear them. They're molded specifically to her feet and can't be manipulated. They're also transparent, so when the other females tried scrunching their feet up to fit the shoe, the prince could see it and knew they were lying. If the slippers were made of fur, they would stretch and bend to fit any number of women, rendering the search completely useless. I tried to explain this in my Cinderella Origins Revisited episode, but as you can tell from the comments, there were still folks who insisted the mistranslation was to blame for the impractical choice of footwear. But in addition to completely disregarding how fur slippers straight up ruin the story's ending, they also underestimated the literary genius of Perot by shrugging off the symbolism. Glass slippers are expensive, delicate, unique, and magical, and Cinderella would have to be light and delicate herself to wear them all night without shattering them into a billion pieces. Those were the qualities that men sought after in women back then. You could be thick, but you had to be delicate and graceful. And while I know tastes have changed over the centuries, back then, most people weren't into human-animal hybrids, so ballroom slippers made of fur would not have had any appeal. Even fancy fur, like Vare. But let's be honest, if Charles Perrault had seen Space Jam, this would have been a very different episode. Now, before you head down to the comment section to voice your opinion on the fur slipper theory, I want to remind you all that we are still taking surveys for the Messed Up Origins field trip that we're planning for 2024. We've already gotten a ton of great feedback with our most popular destinations being Greece, Japan, Scotland, Ireland, and Egypt, but the more of you we hear from, the better. Just hit that Trova Trip link in the description to tell me all about your dream vacation abroad. Then make sure you like and subscribe, because if you're a fan of mythology and folklore, you found on the right channel. I post new short form content every weekday besides Thursday, which is when I post deep dives like this episode around 3 p.m. Central. I'll speak with you all again next week when I dive into the messed up origins of furries. Until then, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.